Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the fifth session of Stakeholder Forum's Countdown to the UN SDG Summit 2023 series of eight webinars in the run-up to the September 2023 SDG Summit. Uh, with the support of experts in each of the first uh, 16 SDG areas, we have been reviewing two SDGs each month. We began in November 2022 and will conclude in June 2023 in the run-up to the July 2023 United States, part of the United Nations High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. This series continues to explore where we are in SDG implementation and to identify transformative changes and actions for change with an emphasis on strengthening the environmental dimension of the 2030 agenda. Today's event has been organized by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future in connection with our proposed 2023 platform, an instrument to support greater and more effective stakeholder participation in the SDG Summit 2023 during this review cycle of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, during the uh, United Nations High Level Political, Perform, uh, Political Forum uh, of, for Sustainable Development uh, at the UN this year. I'm Charles Newhan, Chairman of Stakeholder Forum, and your host today from New York. I'm joined by today's moderator, Dr. David Horan, Assistant Professor at Trinity Business School, Trinity College, Dublin, and a fellow at Stakeholder Forum, where he advises on SDG partnerships and governance for the SDGs. Now, as you can see from your screen, we have a panel of special guests who, with a diverse range of experiences and knowledge, will be introduced by David in the coming minutes. Now, for those of you not familiar with Stakeholder Forum, it is an international not-for-profit NGO in consultative status with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, commonly known as ECOSOC, since 1996. SF has, for more than 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development uh, at all levels uh, and to engage stakeholders uh, in the international forums where decisions are made in their name. Now, a bit of housekeeping before I hand the floor over to our first speaker. Uh, please note that the webinar is being live streamed on YouTube, and a link to that recording will be posted on the Stakeholder Forum website soon afterwards. And as you will see, attendee cameras and microphones are muted and re remain so throughout the webinar. While we would certainly like to have attendees participate, we have some 800 registration registered with us today. So there's really a, not really going to be opportunity to invite uh, participants in. Now, however, there's an opportunity for all of you to pose questions. Um, near the end, we're going to have an expert uh, roundtable discussion where we're going to take questions. We, we will make time for questions. Uh, those questions should be submitted in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat section. The chat section is for you to communicate with each other. You can post uh, links to matters relevant to the webinar topic. You can share your contact details with each other if you wish as well. So do please, uh, we'll remind you during the course of the webinar to put questions in the Q&A box. And also you're welcome to scroll through those questions. You'll be able to see them and you can upvote them. That is, if there's a topic that is of great interest to you, rather than put a separate question in, upvote that, and we'll then be able to focus on uh, consolidated questions, so to speak. However, uh, in advance, I apologize if we can't answer all of the questions due to our time constraints. Now, I'll begin with an introductory comment. Uh, we'll have comments from Jan Gustav Strandenais. Now, Jan Gustav, our first speaker, began working with the UN on environment and governance in the late, pardon me, in the 1970s, actually the early 1970s. He was at the uh, Stockholm Conference in 1972. He's been lecturing about the UN for nearly 50 years, worked for NGOs at the United Nations in New York during the Commission on Sustainable Development years, and has carried out multiple assignment, assignments for UNEP. Early in his career, Jan Gustav worked as a diplomat for Norway's foreign office in Botswana and Uganda, and later directed a large aid and environment NGO in Norway for two decades. Uh, now, Jan Gustav is a long member, longstanding member of Stakeholder Forum's Board of Directors and our senior advisor on governance. His most recent achievement with us is as project manager for the Toward Stockholm Plus 50 project, a joint initiative by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future and the Norwegian Forum for Development and Environment. Jan Gustav, I'll now hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Charles, for introducing me. And as you said, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are on this planet. 
A set of universal values permeates the 2030 Agenda and its SDGs. As UN General Assembly Resolution 70.1, which contains the 2030 Agenda, was unanimously agreed to <clears throat> by 193 member states of the UN back in 2015, the postulation that these values are universal and bequeathed to every human being is neither irreverent nor preposterous, neither is it erroneous. The SDGs have been grouped together in various ways. The most common relates to the three dimensions of sustainable development. There are SDGs with direct relevance to the environment, some to social issues and some to economic issues, but they all carry normative relevance. And a designation and discussion according to ethics and values would therefore also be of significance. We have, as Charles said, reached SDG 9 and 10 in our series to the summit in September. SDG 9 is about build a resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster information. And SDG 10 is about reduce inequality within and among countries. Whereas SDG 9 is a goal that directs itself to concrete measures concerning the economy, SDG 10 also contains direct references to values. The word inequality, which is the imperative word in SDG 10, is a value-laden word and it contains serious responsibilities for those who have vowed to implement it. The entire 2030 agenda is permeated by this and similar value-laden associate words. And the text is rich with these references. Almost like couplets in a rhyme, values are connected. Inequality, equality, and quality. Justice and fairness. Access and rights. Opportunities and fulfillment. All these contexts are identified and are central to the basic ethos of the 2030 Agenda, which is about transformative change. Already the preambular text of the 2030 Agenda establishes the principle of equality, stating unequivocally that, and I quote, no one shall be left behind. In the first five Ps on people, <clears throat> this principle is accentuated, the promise strengthened. We will, and I quote, to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in a healthy environment. Paragraph three in the 2030 Agenda document promises that we will combat inequalities within and among countries. Paragraph seven states that we will establish a world with equitable and un universal access to opportunities. And paragraph eight gives a solemn promise through establishing interlinked values. And I quote, it states, we envisage a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality, and non-discrimination, of respect for race, ethnicity, and cultural diversity, and of equal opportunity, permitting the full realization of human potential and contributing to shared prosperity. SDG 10 consists of 10 targets. A, criti a critical look reveals the following. Eight of the 10 has a focus on economic inequalities. One has a focus on equal opportunities and one on migration, but inequalities encapsulate much more. The birth of the SDGs spawned a new discourse and generated immediately a number of necessary studies to broaden and deepen the understanding of an implication of each of the goals and targets. UNESCO published in 2016 a lucid study on inequalities named Challenging Inequalities, Pathways to a Just World. Already in the introduction, this paper and report reveals a hazard of inequalities. The world is converging around higher levels of inequalities, it says, and they all matter. A meticulous and broad-based study on inequalities and with direct reference to SDG 10, the report grasps the global challenge. And I quote, inequalities are multidimensional, multilayered and cumulative. Understanding and acting effectively upon inequalities require looking beyond income and wealth disparities to capture their political, environmental, social, cultural, spatial and knowledge features. 
Untangling such complexity is a challenge we must fully take on if we are to develop policies and solutions that are feasible and sustainable. A more complete picture of how the 2030 agenda attempts to tackle inequalities emerge when we approaching when approaching the 2030 agenda, we as we always should in an interlinked manner. The universal value basis of the SDGs is often ignored and not understood. By employing the universal value base of the SDGs, an interlinked picture emerges, emerges combining all the SDGs. For instance, the SDG 1 speaks of equal rights to economic resources. Goal 2 about equal access. Goal 4, equal access to education. Number 5 to gender equality, participation and opportunities. Goal 8 repeats equal participation. SDG 10 is all about equality and inequality. Number 15, fair and equitable approaches, and 16, about equal access. This value basis is thoroughly interlinked and manifests itself best in SDG 16, target three, which states to promote the rule of law at the national and international level and ensure equal access to justice for all. And if we did all that, inequalities may be a thing of the past. The UNESCO report states at the end that not enough is known about inequalities and several more studies are needed. UNDESA picked up the mantle and produced the report UNDESA World Social Report 2020. It identifies four megatrends of inequality, technological innovation, then climate change, the third is urbanization, and the fourth international migration. Both reports arrive at a similar conclusion High inequality is an ethical and moral concern across cultures around the world. It also hinders the achievement of the SDGs. SDG 9 is about build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. The US-based McKinsey and Company quickly realized the potential in greening the economy back in 2015. They published two reports that year stating that the global demand for new green infrastructure could amount to more than a turnover of 90 trillion US dollars between 2015 and 2030, which means an average of 6 trillion US dollars per year. In other words, it would almost double the estimated value of the world's existing stock back in 2015, they contended. And it would have led to rebuilding the world infrastructure until 2030. The investment in green infrastructure would be focused on three elements, transport networks, energy networks, and waste and water facilities. The report also identified possible constraints, taxes and government regulations were too. The report did however not ask if we had the resources to rebuild the global infrastructure twice over. Regulation needs to be in place to safeguard the environment and the social structure. The 2030 Agenda lists in paragraph 35 inequality as a cause for violence, lack of security and safety, lack of justice and poor governance. The EU, pushed by its people's concern, developed a taxonomy on sustainable development a couple of years ago. It is established to encourage innovation, encourage investment to implement the SDGs and to safeguard the environment. Innovation within the process of due diligence, which is developed to avoid causing or contributing to adverse impacts on people, on the environment and society, and to prevent adverse impacts directly linked to operations, products or services through business relationships. This system is developed to meet environmental targets, implement, implement a number of the SDGs, while at the same time cause no significant negative impact on other goals and satisfy a minimum of social safeguards. It is indeed an interlinked approach, perhaps to be replicated elsewhere. Experts say in the years to come that a digital ecosystem of data platforms will be crucial in helping the world understand and combat in innovative ways a host of environmental hazards from air pollution to methane emissions. Responding to the triple planetary crisis, Unipas focused on innovative practices to work on climate change, biodiversity, and pollution. To help tackle air pollution, UNEP is working with partners to find technology and innovation solutions to promote major structural transformations that will enhance environmental sustainability, climate action, and pollution prevention. 
UNEP is contributing through its digital transformation program and by co-championing the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability, digital in initiatives to leverage technology to halt the decline of the planet and accelerate sustainable finance, products, services, and lifestyles. Our first focus is on managing freshwater and air pollution. UNEP is also backing up UN Biodiversity Lab 2.0, which is a free open source platform that features data and more than 400 maps with spatial data on nature that will help decision makers put nature at the heart of sustainable development. It also offers visualization of the, nat of the natural systems that hold back natural disasters, store plant warming gases like carbon dioxide, and provide food and water to billions and help prevent disasters. Good things are happening. Our question must be, is the scale for these things large enough, bold enough, and fair enough? A final consideration from the UNESCO report on inequalities combine the challenges embodied in SDG 9 and 10 and directs us to SDG 17, challenging us to develop partnerships on an equal level with all parties involved. And I quote, countering inequalities requires robust knowledge but knowledge alone is not enough. The challenge is to improve the connection between what we know and how we act, to mobilize the knowledge of the social and human sciences, to inform policies, underpin decisions, and enable wise and transparent management of the shift towards more equitable and inclusive societies. And in this sense, investment in knowledge is a down payment for informed change. Thank you so much for your attention. You know, Gustav, thank you ever so much for setting the scene, uh, but also uh, for being one of the few people in the world who can so well integrate uh, just the importance of the interlinkages with the SDGs and, of course, the challenges uh, that we face today. So thank you very much for that. Now, uh, please welcome uh, my colleague, Dr. David Horn, uh, who, who will introduce our panel of experts. David is an adjunct research fellow at University College Dublin School of Politics and International Relations. And, and at the School of Business. Since 2018, David has been conducting research on data and governance frameworks for the SDGs with a focus on multi-stakeholder partnerships and their role in supporting effective and equitable implementation. He is the author of A New Approach to Partnerships for SDG Transformations and Towards a Portfolio Approach Partnerships for Sustainable Transformations. From 2018 to 2020, David was a visiting scholar at Columbia University Center for Sustainable Development and the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network in New York. David, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Charles, for the introduction and to Jan Gustav for your valuable comments. On behalf of Stakeholder Forum, I'd like to welcome everyone to our discussion of SDGs 9 and 10. We have six excellent speakers. Uh, as in previous webinars, each speaker will first discuss their recommendations on ways to enable integrated approaches. This will then be followed by questions from the audience. Please submit your questions in the Q&A section. And I will now briefly introduce the speakers to everyone. First, you will hear from a pioneer in the field of sustainability and ESG services. Ms. Stina Lees Hattestad Bratsberg, partner at KPMG Norway and head of strategy and transformation at the EMA ESG Hub. Second, we are delighted to have with us the lead author of the Steering Research and Innovation for Global Goals Strings Report, Dr. Tommaso Chiari, senior researcher at UNU Merit, United Nations University, and the Science Policy Research Unit SPRU at the University of Sussex Business School. Our third speaker is a leading expert in capacity building for digital transformation, Dr. Lydia Stepinska Ustashak, area leader in international collaboration and partnerships at the Center for Foresight and Internationalization at Lucas Sowetsch uh, Institute of Organization and Management in Industry, Orgmash. Fourth, uh, we are really delighted to have with us a global change leader in fostering better knowledge systems for sustainable development, Ms. Andrea Ordonez, director at Southern Voice, uh, a network of 60 plus think tanks from Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean and Asia. 
Fifth, uh, we are delighted to have also with us the global lead of the second edition of Southern Voices flagship initiative, State of the SDGs, Dr. Sajet Amin, Deputy Executive Director and founding head of the Policy Solutions Lab at the Sustainable Development Policy Institute, SDPI, in Pakistan. To finish off, we will hear from a leading expert in transformational policy advice for achieving the SDGs in fragile contexts, Ms. Radia. Uh, Ms. Radia Sawi, Chief of the Energy Section, Climate Change and Natural Resource Sustainability Cluster at UN Esquire. We are very grateful to have you all here and we look forward to your contributions. I would now like to pass the floor to Ms. Dina Hattestat. In light of your extensive experience in ESG consulting, we would be very grateful for your recommendations. Thank you so much, uh, David, and thank you for inviting me to this um, panel discussion. I've been looking forward to it, and uh, I've also been lucky working with the SDGs for a very, very, very long time. My uh, experience is totally from the business world, and um, actually, uh, the SDGs is a game changer for the business world. When they came back in 2016, they were like a working plan for the whole world. And we didn't have that before. And as Jan Vista was telling us, it's really an interlink uh, between all the 17 goals, but the, uh, how do you say, the, the ev evol um, how it's been evolved and uh, experienced through business world is that a lot of the businesses, they are looking at those SDGs that where they have their largest impact. Where do we have uh, the largest impact where what is material for us and then they're picking out some SDGs that they really can have an impact on and working very tight with those SDGs but the experience that we see is that more and more businesses understand that we have to have a more holistic view on the SDGs as well and see how everything fits together and see how one uh, uh, goal impact the others and today it's focused on nine and 10. And I will give some examples and I will concentrate most about nine, but nine won't happen in a good manner without taking care of 10. And I think it should be not a question of how, and uh, no, not a question if, but it's just a question of how everybody can be included. So let me start with one of the things that I often say when I work with um, business world is that just start with a need. Start with a need that the people have out there and try to decouple from what is the existing, existing way of solving that need. Because if you do that, you'd look at solution and innovation. And in this case, we're talking about infrastructure in a large uh, scale, uh, totally different. And for instance, in Norway, we are so lucky. We are almost not having any uh, cars driven by diesel or uh, heavy fuel anymore. It's all EV cars, very many EV cars. But what we do is that we still fix the need that somebody's going to move from one place to another, but we're fixing it with a car. So the same amount of people is sta standing in the same long lines and people can't go into some of our cities some days in the year because of pollution. So we need to, uh, I'm not saying that EV cars is not the right solution. It's one of the solutions, but it's just to give you an example that it's not always just to find a solution. Uh, that is to adjust the way we solve a need today. Uh, so this is an uh, interesting view of looking at things. And for instance, if we take this uh, issue around uh, transport moving in and out of cities and the infrastructure around it, when we talk about transport, uh, I think it's about 80% of the uh, cities and um, municipalities uh, that are certain state uh, size globally, they are located by an ocean or a sea. And then we could have much more transport on e electrical boats, ships and everything uh, that we didn't have to buy, buy uh, and invest in new infrastructure on the roads. But it was just an example. Uh, and I think that also we, it is fair to say that a lot of the <clears throat> investment that comes from the business world and the innovation that is happening on the infrastructure has to be in collaboration with the public sector. So the combination between how 
we partner up between public and private sector is extremely important. For instance, when we are trying to have as much as possible renewable energy, um, it doesn't help if the infrastructure on the energy network is not built out in the amount that it needs to be built out. So one, it's also a question about what's coming first, what's coming second. And very often though, we also see that a lot of the businesses that we work with, they have to look into a larger industrial ecosystem than what they normally uh, have done. And that also comes because of the infrastructure around solutions that they're trying to bring to the market. Uh, they need to collaborate outside of the uh, core value chain to actually secure that, the, um, how do you say, uh, from the business point of view, what they are delivering to solve some issues is actually what the client and the people are needing, but the infrastructure and the whole value chain around it is in place. And um, I, for instance, could give you an example from shipping. It doesn't help very much if we find another fuel uh, to uh, for shipping industry if we don't figure out how to uh, have the fuel stations uh, alongside all the shipping uh, transport arenas or and the harbors that is global. So everything is so closely connected, and a lot of the innovation and a lot of the r and &E that we see invested in. And uh, we talk a lot about circular economy now as well. And I would say that a lot of this, it is not, how do you say, equal amount of men and women, for instance, that stands behind new innovations. Especially in technology, uh, we see that it's more men than women. And what we produce, what we develop, and what we deliver then is also then maybe not perfect fit for women. And that doesn't only come for, for small products. It also comes when you talk about innovation on infrastructure. And then moving on to another example of what we, how do you see, uh, the, the, the importance of scale and speed. Uh, Norway, we are very lucky. We have a lot of ocean all around the, the, our country. But still, it is this week that we first come out with two large Norwegian uh, competitions on offshore wind. And uh, very many uh, would say, why just no? I'm working now in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and I get a lot of questions, why not before? So yes, uh, we need the speed and we need the scale. And I think if we do not collaborate between public and private, um, <clears throat> then we will not manage to speed up in the scale that's actually needed. And in the end here, I would just like to tell you a little, very short about a project that we launched from KPMG side together with some um, organizations like uh, United Cities. Uh, during the COP27, and it's something called Net Zero Urban Program, and it's actually a program where we try to help bridge capital uh, to scalable solutions, investable and scalable solutions, and we're using Digital Twin to predict the future, and then also look at the solutions in a holistic view and look at it as a systemic view. And not only including, um, how do you say, the, the physical, but also the, the human part. So I don't have time to go into details, uh, but I think if we continue to establish like uh, initiatives like this uh, rather small one, but still I hope uh, with a great impact, that is the Net Zero Urban Program and the uh, initiative like First Mover Coalition uh, that is actually a coalition that tries to bring to the world the technology brought forward by those who stands for the largest amount of um, uh, emission globally. And then you also have this, for instance, uh, just, trans just transition and other global initiatives that I really would say 
I hope we can bring forward in both the skill and scale that is needed. And uh, to summarize, I think we have no chance uh, to solve all the issues that we are facing unless we collaborate really tight within the businesses, even with competitors and between uh, businesses and the public sector. So that was uh, what I was going to say. So thank you for giving the floor to me and uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you very much, Stina. Uh, that was wonderful and uh, especially grateful for giving us insights on, on how the SDGs are being adopted uh, in the business world and the need to move beyond selective picking of which goals to focus on to a more holistic approach. And I, I completely agree with you that uh, collaboration with public sector and I would also add civil society is needed mm, to shift yeah. to, to inclusive, scalable and equitable uh, solutions. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I know you have to go to uh, another webinar at quarter, to, at quarter to the hour. So just want to say thanks from everyone for, for your, uh, your intervention. Thank you for having me here. Um, so I will, I will now give the floor to Dr. Tommaso Chiari. Uh, in light of your recent global report on changing directions, we would love to hear your thoughts on ways to align uh, science, technology, and innovation with the sustainable development. Thank you very much, David. I uh, hope you can hear me um, well. Good. Can hear you uh, and uh, really, uh, thank you, Charles, and the Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future for this uh, very kind invitation. I think this is a very important initiative um, and uh, a very nice panel today as well. Uh, so really happy to contribute to this panel. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to discuss four main points, uh, particularly in relation to a recent uh, report that uh, David was mentioning before that we finished, we published in October about how we could steer research and development uh, towards the SDGs. And uh, I think uh, some of these points will resonate quite well with um, what uh, Stina has been uh, presenting, which I think was extremely relevant, but also what uh, Jan Gustav was, was mentioning before. So I will touch uh, uh, on, on those main four points. The first one is about who decides, uh, so looking at the role of inequality in defining innovation trajectories, in defining what is innovation, so not just the impact of inequality and innovation, but the other way around, uh, which will lead me to talk a little bit about uh, the need for capabilities and how these need to be uh, more distributed, particularly in low and middle income countries, in order for uh, stakeholders in these countries to participate in innovation. Uh, process. The third point would be about uh, the impacts that innovation has on uh, inequality. And the fourth point uh, would be about the need for uh, more research which looks at the synergies and trade-offs um, and, and complementarities and, and non-complementarities between the different uh, SDGs. Uh, and then I hope I have a little bit of time to, to, to say some of the recommendations that we discuss um, in the report, but very quickly. Uh, and then um, I'll just, just leave, leave the floor for the discussion. Uh, so on uh, who decides, I think this is very important because I think we all agree about infrastructure and diversification being essential to economic development, but which infrastructure, which diversification is a different uh, matter and is probably the uh, matter. Uh, so we can obviously use uh, tools from smart specialization, mapping of diversification opportunities to understand which are the areas in which countries or regions can move, uh, but which directions this investment will take um, <clears throat> depends on who participates and who takes uh, decisions in, in, in those uh, investments. And I think the example here that um, uh, Sina was making is, is extremely relevant. We can think, for example, about the share of researchers in medical sciences, the inventors in medical sciences. We know there's many fewer uh, women inventors than men inventors in medical sciences. And uh, we also know that women inventors are much more focused on health uh, issues uh, related to women, but because there's much fewer of them, then health issues related to women are much less taken. So it is important to think about where it is important to think about who participates in those decision making in terms of having inclusive uh, transformation in, in uh, SDG 9. And for this, I think it's important to think about how we can improve capabilities across the world, across stakeholders, across different areas. There is an urgent need to develop capabilities, especially in low-income countries, 
um, to make better decisions about what infrastructure and what diversification is needed. We seem to be still like stuck to sort of 50 years ago development uh, approaches where uh, decisions about where to invest are made uh, in, in countries which are different from those in which been, the, the investment is happening. Uh, so in our uh, study, in our string support, uh, we do show that there's been a, 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 very, a very good improvement in the research and development and research on SDG 9 um, in low-income countries and middle-income countries, but we also estimate that the contribution of uh, low-income countries to R&D is around 0.2%. Uh, this is a, a, a hugely low uh, number if we think about the capabilities which are needed in order to develop the competences uh, to then make decisions in order to invest, in order to diversify. If we think about patenting activity, we're talking about 0.02% in low-income countries, which is really a small number. And these capabilities, I think, uh, are needed both in the private sector and in the public sector, where some of these decisions are uh, made. Uh, the third point was about then the impacts that innovation inequality has, the, the, sorry, the innovation has on uh, inequality. Uh, and uh, so beyond the capabilities, which I think is essential, also voice is essential. I connect back to the first point. Uh, who participates in, in decisions about um, uh, uh, innovation process determines what is the impact uh, of, uh, of innovation. Uh, so if we think about uh, innovation per se generates inequalities. So I think uh, this is because of innovation properties. It, it's based on accumulating knowledge. It is dependent. It is uncertain. So when we do innovate, we have to think that inequalities will be created. And as we know, there's also lots of non-foreseen consequences of innovation. Uh, think about, you know, uh, pollution, think about uh, water pollution, think about building a dam uh, in rural areas to serve um, uh, uh, electricity in, in urban areas. And all, all these consequences that are not uh, foreseen before then tend to be, again, unequally distributed across the population. Uh, think of climate shocks uh, these days, so on and so forth. Uh, so it is crucial to combine policies on structural change with policies on inclusion. And this is not only because um, the, uh, uh, there's, 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 there's a moral statement there, as was mentioned before, uh, that we should make technologies uh, which are relevant for everybody, but also because by not increasing inclusion, by not uh, increasing the distribution of opportunities, we are losing a huge amount of talents which are not participating in the innovation process. Uh, we know, it, for example, again, that uh, most of the uh, innovators come from uh, privileged families, wealthy families that live in areas where they have already contacts, so they go to good schools, so on and so forth. Those who are not privileged, they do not, are much, much less likely to become innovators, ceteris paribus, having the same IQ. So again, we're, we're, we're losing a lot of innovation there, uh, which, uh, which could be included, which could uh, uh, be, you know, a, an essential source for SDG 9, while also addressing SDG 10. And fourth uh, is a need for research to better understanding synergies and trade-offs between SDGs. So there's very little research, there is some, but there's very little research which looks at how technological responses relate to complex underlying issues such as inequalities, gender inequalities, education, conflict, so on and so forth. Uh, so for example, we see that most of the research which is done on science, technology, and innovation, SDG 9, uh, is carried out mainly in relation to uh, technological solutions, such as those re related to SDG 7 or SDG 8, so affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, um, but much less related to quality education, um, SDG 4, reducing inequality, SDG 10, which we're discussing today, but also poverty, SDG 1, or peace, SDG 16. So focusing mainly on technological interventions in, in isolation, undermines our capacity to investigate those synergies and tensions between how uh, we innovate and the impact that this innovation may have, and again, losing uh, because we're, we're leaving behind uh, people who may be uh, in, involved in the innovation process. So some of the, uh, so very quickly, um, um, just in the one, one, one more minute, just say some of the uh, uh, interventions that we think might be relevant uh, from the research side uh, in order to improve the alignment between science and technology innovation to the SDGs, particularly uh, addressing inequality, is first of all, funders and researchers and, and international organizations should ensure that 
funding of research is directed toward SDG related issues. And this may include investing more in low income countries, which are doing much more research related to SDGs than uh, uh, in the global north. There should be more focus and increased funding on research that underlies uh, these, these issues of deprivation, inequality, and conflict in connection to the other uh, SDGs. Um, there should be more uh, focus on areas uh, which connect several SDGs. Again, there are areas of research that, that there are researchers, there are research which do connect to many different SDGs. And these are very important to understand uh, the relationship, the, the potential trade offs, the potential synergies. But we need more research there than it is uh, currently done, that is currently funded. And we need to involve a more diverse set of actors in uh, research funding decisions so that uh, we have we give more opportunities to define the directions of, uh, of innovation. So we need to promote a rich diversity of pathways, of science technology pathways that can address in different way SDG challenges in ways which can be, again, very diverse according to locations, but also according to different stakeholders. And we put forward uh, the potential the design of potential accountable initiatives to strengthen science and technology innovation governance and support more open and inclusive process of deliberation and prioritization, including potentially a global platform observatory, observatory to conduct a regular scrutiny, regular service, re surveys, regular understanding of which uh, uh, research and innovation investment is done, with whom, and this may be part of the current uh, UN system or maybe a different organization. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there because I think I'm running out of time, but uh, happy to share more of these uh, uh, details in the chat. And thanks again uh, for, for listening. Thank you, Tommaso. Uh, very important insights there. And uh, I think as we, we, we move forward in the coming years, those insights are going to be even more important as technology uh, develops. And it's, I think it's we need all need to be aware of the role that participation plays in, in deciding what technologies will develop and what how these will shape the impacts and the need for capabilities to, to, to have a proper debate about all of that. Um, so uh, thanks a million for, for that. Uh, I will now give the floor to Dr. Lydia Stepinska Ustashek. Uh, and we look forward to your uh, to your recommendations on ways to manage trade-offs from digital transformation. Thank you very much for invitation and for having me here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, I have the pleasure of working for the Institute for Management and Organization in Industry Orgmash, which is part of Łukasiewicz Research Network, the third largest research network in Europe, consisting of 22 institutes working on innovation for digital and green transformation in all sectors. Uh, I am also honored to represent the Europe region in the Group on Capacity Building Initiatives, which is uh, an advisory body to the International Telecommunication Union, a UN agency specializing in telecommunication in ICT. This group gives its opinion on capacity building activities and programs that are implemented by International Telecommunication Union in all regions. Therefore, uh, today I would like to share with you my observations uh, and experience gathered both uh, in the GCBI and in the research work of my institute. When we are uh, talking about the interdependencies between SDGs, uh, it's worth noting that both uh, the pandemic and the current geopolitical situation closely linked to the war in Ukraine and its social and economic consequences have strongly reinforced these interdependencies. As analysis confirm, uh, the linkages between the most affected SDGs uh, are intensified and uh, their impact on the goals is uh, currently increased. Current emerging challenges for the implementation of SDG 3, SDG 4, SDG 8, uh, 12 uh, and 13 can impact further implementation uh, of uh, the SDG 5, uh, SDG 10, SDG 17, uh, and SDG 11. 
But today, uh, I would like to focus on SDG 9 uh, infrastructure and innovation and its connection to other goals, particularly SDG 4. Both of these uh, targets were hit hard by, by the pandemic and geopolitical changes of the recent year. And now, uh, uh, when we stand on the threshold of a decade of uncertainty, uh, they require a serious strategic approach, revision and setting of new priorities. Uh, the current economic situation, uh, inflation, problems with raw material, materials and supply chains do not encourage investment in innovation, the research and development. Both countries uh, and private companies are being forced to reduce uh, investment and it is not surprising that investment in R&D uh, is being reduced first. Uh, the negative impact of the pandemic on uh, the quality and accessibility of education has been analyzed and commented on many times in the public debate, so it does not require further explanation. Uh, but uh, I would like to highlight that hopes and plans for new technologies uh, that will facilitate access to quality, personalized education supported by development of artificial intelligence are now being verified uh, by the economic crisis on the one hand uh, and by the rapid development of artificial intelligence that is escaping regulation and ethical standards on the other hand. Uh, our institute published a study uh, earlier this year uh, titled Seven Technology Trends That Will Change the World. Uh, among them, at least four uh, are directly related to achieving SDG 9. Uh, let me refer to just a few examples. Uh, the first is development of smart grids and high-tech uh, energy storage facilities. Uh, and uh, this trend will not only support the green transition, but will also prevent power shortages uh, in industry through intelligent uh, power management. The second example is growth of uh, in use of nanomaterials. Uh, nanotechnologies are categorized uh, as so-called frontier technologies. Such technologies can have a tremendous positive impact uh, on economies and societies, and also the development of related technologies uh, as well as the achievement of, uh, of the goals of sustainable development. Application of hydrogen in steel production will support decarbonization of, uh, of the steel uh, industry. And the next is development of drone technologies. Uh, scientific analysis has highlighted uh, three uh, technologies in this trend area, traffic management and uh, automation of work, drone systems as part of 6G networks and cybersecurity of unmanned uh, aerial vehicle systems. So, uh, when we look at the goals uh, of education as DG4, uh, one of the most critical indicators uh, is the percentage of lifelong learners. Uh, this is a very important indicator uh, and its importance uh, continues to grow. Why is uh, this the case? Uh, just because we are seeing a growing demand uh, for new sets of skills related to the development of technology, the circular economy, and uh, the climate challenges. And it's clear that formal education is not enough for many reasons. Upskilling will be crucial to address the skill gap. Uh, 2023 is European Year of Skills. Having a workforce uh, with the skills that are in demand contributes to sustainable growth, leads to more uh, innovation and improve a company's competitiveness. What's next? To conclude, it's time to restore synergies between uh, these two uh, SDGs, SDG 4 and SDG 9, uh, which should reinforce it each other if uh, we are going to navigate through this decade of uncertainty uh, effectively and safely. 
Uh, firstly, education systems should take into account the need uh, of uh, lifelong learning because only in this way we will be able to create a human uh, resource base for modern industry and the development of innovation. Secondly, education, uh, educational programs for universities should be created in close collaboration uh, with the private sector, otherwise formal education will become useless for, from the perspective of the labor market. And I can repeat um, after the first uh, speaker that only cross-sectoral collaboration uh, will lead to, to appropriate solutions. Uh, so this is exactly what I wanted to highlight today. Thank you for the floor uh, and thank you again for having me here. Thanks a million, Lydia. That was that was really great and nicely complimented the previous speakers. Um, and uh, thanks very much for highlighting how the pandemic has led to a drop in R&D investments and investments uh, access to, to skills and education and for a quite comprehensive overview of different technologies that are developing and the need for uh, lifelong learning and, uh, and skills investment, um, and also for emphasizing the theme of participation. Um, so I'll now pass the floor to Dr. Sajed Amin. Um, in light of the report you are leading for Southern Voice, we will be most grateful for uh, your insights. Thank you, Dr. David. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Living. I think given very uh, limited time, I'll try to make five points uh, that, that I will be slightly then briefly explaining. But I think we are really uh, meeting at this point. It's a very critical time for SDGs agenda, particularly in terms of inequalities, for two, three reasons. Uh, we are left with just seven years uh, to touch the mark of 2030. And there are two very uh, important things that are happening. Number one, uh, we were slow on uh, meeting inequality agenda, actually. Uh, more than other goals, we were lagging on, on this target. And I'll just explain that why did we lag uh, on this inequality agenda. But more importantly and worryingly, some of the recent happenings, you see uh, the, the COVID-19, uh, one most important now Russia's invasion in Ukraine, are actually not only reversing the progress on uh, this uh, SDGs 10, are in general overall inequality uh, in all other goals, but also introducing new forms of inequality. And the, the digital divide as a catalyzing factor for inequalities from education market to labor market were not as much critical as it is now after COVID-19. Particularly, the responses, I think the worrying part is in terms of SDGs uh, 10 and inequality, that the policy responses to these crises are actually further strengthening those inequalities. You mentioned our state of SDGs report. I think it, it's really interesting, the, the central theme that we are taking up at this report is that what are the long lasting inequalities that these crises like COVID-19 has produced? which can really pose a serious risk to SDGs agenda. You see, the, the, the learning outcomes are now dependent on your access to internet, how good you are covered. And these are not creating inequalities within countries, but at across the countries as well. The countries having low coverage, low internet quality, they, they, they are suffering more of these losses. And at the same time, Within countries, these losses are very disproportionately distributed on those who are already most vulnerable. And again, other worrying point is like those who are most affected by, for example, COVID-19, the poor, the workers who are working in informal sectors, they are least likely to catch up in, in the business as huge model, if you see. I mean, there there is a fundamental, the, the findings that we are find is that fundamental change in skill demand. There is now new skills in the market which are in demand. The skills, elementary skills in the informal sector skills, they have been sort of eliminated. They are now overcome with the new skill sets. And those who have gone jobless, they, they have very less chance of being rehired because their capacity to skill updating skill 
uplifting is very limited actually. So that is the second, uh, I think the very important point that there is a reversal, but more importantly, there is new types of inequality. And that I think is the major contribution that our uh, state of SDGs report, second edition is trying to make. We really identify the new and long lasting inequalities that COVID-19 has produced in education sector. It has created a permanent learning divide. In the labor market, it has created a permanent long lasting divide of your access and capabilities to access to labor market. And they do have an intergenerational uh, impact. So that was my second point. At a macro level, if you see, uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine has created a big gap across the countries. The countries, those who are already dead distressed, the, the rise in commodity oil prices has really limited their capacity to finance uh, those people who are really suffering from the food inflation, for example. So this is, a, again, a very differentiated impact that this crisis has done on uh, this one. Uh, for example, I'm speaking from Pakistan. When in 2015, I was leading the work on SDGs localization in Pakistan, we were developing the framework. We were really more hopeful than we are in 2023, seven years. Number three point is actually, I think the, the one of the thing that needs to go, I mean, there, there can be a question that what, what needs to be done. But before that, I'll just take one point also that when there are new inequalities, new shapes of inequalities, there are some new players that needs to be factored in. And that comes to your question on partnerships. Who are the stakeholders? I think the one of the key stakeholders that has been less focused on that is the central bank sector, the central banking, the IMF. It has become really critical now uh, that that for and even if you see the SDGs 10, it has a direct 10.4 goal target most probably. That is exactly related to the IMF's fiscal space and other policies. And this is linked uh, to the ongoing crisis actually. If when you are in dis debt, debt distress, you go to IMF, there is a consolidation policies actually. And those consolidation policies are putting skewed burden, disproportionate burden on the poor, the vulnerable. For example, if you have to go for stabilization, uh, the, the standard toolkit of IMF is uh, raise energy price hikes, raise policy rate, and cut subsidies, go for austerities. All this burden goes to the poor people, those who are already most vulnerable there. And at the same time, the capacity of the governments I mean, Pakistan is the recent example to support those who are vulnerable and those who are suffering these losses is very limited. So I think one area that we need to expand on is uh, to bring in a more vibrant discussion on role of central banks and the role of IMF in uh, these uh, going next seven forward. That will be very critical if we really have to bridge the divide between the developed world and the developing countries, Africa, Pakistan, South Asia, and many other countries. The question is what can be done? I'll just close with on this one. I know the very limited time. Number one, we need to shift our focus from inequalities of outcome, like income inequality, like wealth inequality, because they are the symptoms of a more deep rooted structural inequalities of access to health, access to education, entry to labor market, entry to skill development market, if social protection availability. This is actually producing the outcome inequalities. And I think I would again, uh, I, I'm sure Andrea will be speaking more on it most probably. This is one major contribution that our report will be bringing that what are those structural inequalities which are shaping these inequalities of outcome that needs to be considered. That is the point number one. We need a fundamental shift on our focus actually. Number two. Number two, I think my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lydia, I mean, really uh, sort of on interdependencies of SDGs. But unfortunately, the higher the interdependency between SDGs is, the separation, higher the separation is between the policies. You find a very clear divide between economic policy, the social policy, the environment policy, the climate policy. And actually we have divided this policy responses to on the two angles. One are the forces producing inequalities. 
economic policy, taxation, indirect taxation, that keep producing inequalities. And on the other side, we have a very residual policies, what we call social policy. The focus, the priority on social policy was a residual policy. And economic policy was producing inequalities, while the social policy as very residual policy was trying to sort of cover up those symptoms that has really led us go. And I think we need a framework going forward, which is not only trade-offs. We, we haven't succeeded on trade-offs. I mean, because the production of inequality by economic policy was much higher than the dampening or controlling those inequalities by the social policy, because the, there were residual focus, residual allocations. I mean, the social protection allocation, social spending allocation in developing countries, particularly in my country, or if there is something left, we will give it to the social policy. But at the same time, tax collections and other forces, they were producing inequalities. So we need an integrated framework, which now does not focus on trade-offs, which primarily focus on integrating the social, economic, political, and climate inequalities into a broader economic policy framework. I summarize it in a way that macroeconomic policies are the economic policies should have a social content now within themselves. It is not that first four months you produce inequalities and then you go for social protection, some spending that you will uh, do. At a more macro level, and that is my last point, I'm sorry, I know it, it's uh, time. The world global community has to now come forward on at least four fronts. If we have to cut the divide between across the countries and that has implication within countries as well. Number one, we have to go for climate justice at a more macro level. There has been so much talks on COPs, but action is not there. We saw, still don't know what is uh, happening on the climate fund actually. So the, the global community, the global thought leaders have now to ensure climate justice at more level, macro level, global level, and the governments within developing countries, those who are going for this green transition, our climate transition, environmental transition, need also to ensure climate justice within themselves. The groups, those who are losing, needs to be protected. For example, the coal mines, it's good to go renewable energy, but at the same time, we have to protect those people who are most likely to lose jobs permanently because their capacity to develop new skills is very limited. So this is within countries, that is number one. Number two, I think we need to have some sort of framework for debt distressed countries because these are the countries who are the most vulnerable. And good part is that there is now a discussion on some sort of global uh, rule-based debt resolution uh, sort of system uh, to, to, to kind of provide that fiscal space. It can be debt swaps, uh, other things uh, like this one. So this is uh, from my side, I hope I've missed so much because it is so uh, broad agenda, but I'm available, but I'll just close with this one uh, that I think uh, we look forward to speak more at a more fundamental levels. And to me, most critical is that separation between macro policy, economic policy, social policy, and climate policies need to go. And this is where our state of SDGs report really touches on very critical issues of technology divide, of learning poverty divide that is happening. So I think uh, we, we need a more fundamental shift in discussions, focus, new stakeholders, and the new tools and instruments that needs to be developed for the new technologies and the new kind of inequalities. Thank you. Million, so Jed, that was, um, that was really very interesting, uh, an excellent, profound analysis of inequalities and uh, the need to address structural inequalities. Um, we look, we very much look forward to reading your report. Uh, just in the matters, uh, matter of interest of time, I'll just move quickly now to Ms. Andrea Adornes. Uh, in light of your esteemed work to leverage Southern evidence and analysis to promote fair global development debates, we would be grateful for your recommendations. Thank you very much for, for having me. And it's, uh, it's great that we get an opportunity with Sajid to share some of the um, initial reflections that our uh, State of the SDG report um, is putting on the table for us. Um, Southern Voices is a network of over 60 think tanks across 
Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and the job, the work that Sajid is leading uh, includes, um, you know, a, a, um, 10 of uh, organizations across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So it really brings a lot of breath um, into the discussion. And um, I just wanted to add a small reflection um, of setting these within the current discussion of the SDG summit and the um, next steps in the 2030 agenda uh, more broadly. Um, and it builds on, on, on the research that uh, Sajid is presenting, but also on other types of, um, of research, research that are emerging from our network. Um, and one of the concerns that we've seen and that we are um, talking more and more with researchers in the Global South is um, a concern uh, about the framing of what these um, upcoming years is going to be for the SDG agenda. So as we know, uh, we moved from a decade of action framing before the pandemic towards a framing around acceleration um, of change. And that is very much central in the in the discussions, both in terms of the SDG summit, in terms of the of um, uh, our common agenda, um, all the summits that are happening, and and the framing is much is a lot about um, uh, rapid transformation, about scaling quickly, and so on. And precisely some of the challenges that that Sajid has um, has been mentioning that we are observing in different sectors have happened because uh, policy responses uh, get done too quickly, right? So that uh, we are not always in, in, a, in a sense ready to accelerate. And that is where I think it's important for us to bring the, the lenses of inequality uh, for all the, the 2030 agenda. So um, the experience uh, of, uh, uh, of COVID, I think really, um, uh, showcases this this problem, and this is something that we need to just think of the the way we frame and the way we encourage action in the next in the next years, right? So um, around education, there was a fast adoption of digital technologies and so on, but we know that as Sajid was mentioning, these will actually probably increase inequalities, right? So um, in as a whole, when we're thinking about the, the 2030 agenda and about um, the type of policy recommendations and the type of, um, of responses that, um, that uh, need to be put out there, I think there is a growing concern um, that we've been hearing from experts in the Global South of only a framing around acceleration. And um, there needs to be also space uh, for uh, reflecting on some of the policies that need to be done. Some need to be totally redirected into some other areas. Um, there needs to be also reimagining uh, of certain things like we were discussing around uh, climate or so on. So it's just um, that this framing, this current framing of how uh, uh, we're looking at the period to come in the SDGs. I think we all have to be uh, a little bit conscious based on our uh, experience with COVID and the lessons that we are extracting of not um, only pressing the accelerator uh, into, into scaling and making everything faster, but how are we going to really uh, have this, this period of time be transformative? Um, so I think that that would be just my my adding point for this discussion and for the broader thinking about um, you know this discussion about interlinkages and moving the the agenda forward. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for this valuable contribution and uh, for highlighting the importance of the need for groundwork uh, uh, to reduce inequalities before we 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 put our foot on the accelerator. Um, I'll now uh, move to uh, Ms. Uh, Radia Sadawi, uh, and um, <clears throat> thank you for waiting patiently, uh, Radia, and uh, uh, I'll hand the floor now to you to complete what's been an excellent uh, round table. Uh, given your work on the humanitarian peace development nexus, we would love to hear your thoughts on ways to enable integrated approaches in fragile countries. 
Thanks, David. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I think um, after the present, perfectly. yeah, after the presentation done by by Kostav and the looking to the integrated approach of the 2030 agenda, which practically uh, now we are the decade of action, and the globe is not in track in any way in achieving the SDGs. Maybe I, I would like to reflect first on the the what we've been doing and ensuring a just inclusive energy transition, specifically uh, as a lead author of the high level dialogue on energy on the report that we, we published in 2021, which is still relevant in looking how really we need to work on enhancing the synergies and adjusting the trade-offs and energy as enabler, specifically when looking to resilient infrastructure development, looking also how the uh, specifically that the, the progress in renewable energy technology development is also highly uh, linked to the existence uh, of innovative industries. So technically speaking, uh, at the same time, when we look at in the other hand of the energy transition, we need also that the need of the systematic shift to new sources will lead to earlier the time of fossil fuel infrastructure, but also uh, looking to upscaling the infrastructure and mining, and all of that has ne negative implications for this industry, sometimes the less productive policies also and measures as highlighted by previous speakers uh, on this aspect. So maybe from our perspective, looking that the policy makers, uh, businesses, societies, or all as a whole need to really go beyond what was uh, done and look collaboratively, but we need to ensure that no one is left behind. Really, no one is left behind and uh, everyone is on board. That's why let me maybe reflect on the question that you highlighted maybe from the Arab regional perspective uh, as uh, the portfolio that uh, I lead from the, from the energy uh, aspect of climate change. When we take the region, maybe some would not know that the region is characterized as the most unequal globally and was witnessing the worst only increase in extreme poverty. And when you speak about conflict, which also is one of the reasons of this level of poverty, we, which link it to SDG 16, we see that the conflict has negatively impacted the region. We see the destruction of national infrastructure, be it for energy, water, and sanitation, but also the look into urban rural divide. And just in terms of migration, uh, the, if we take the, just uh, the flow of international migration, 15% of the migrant and refugees worldwide are in the Arab region and 14% of the migrant workers globally are in just 12 countries of the region. So we see how really the, 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 the region has a multifaceted vulnerabilities, not only from the water and energy and food security and climate change, but also in terms of uh, political instability and conflict, which led to increasing this inequality. And that's why from, from the ISQA perspective, we've been working on enhancing how to enhance the decision synergy and adjusted trade-offs, because we believe that only through a framework that accompanies the humanitarian, the development, the peace nexus, that we can really achieve a, a result without peace, where energy should be a source of peace and not of conflict, which is the case in uh, currently. So only if we have a protracted and complex crisis that we leave them currently, it's only through sustainable solutions that we can achieve them. And that's why coordination is, is, is essential, as highlighted by previous speakers cooperation between all concerned national, regional, international organizations, and also the private sector and civil society is a key. And among the nexus that we look at as a key of development in order to address inequality, address the inequality as well in terms of also, uh, enhancing and the uh, adjacent peace and enhancing the synergies between the economic sectors. Uh, we start by looking how to strengthen the public institutions, which are currently the weakest uh, in our uh, in our region by mainstreaming this triple nexus approach within the public sector and also focusing on the depletion of human resources and, and the brain drain from the public sector to sometimes the private sector, but also to other countries. And that's why investment in education is not given a result because most of those people educated leave the, leave the, 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 leave the country and migrate as well where they have better environment, economic development. But also the government, the donors, the humanitarian agencies they should really work together proactively in terms of peace building where sometimes and usually we 
see it's not just one spot solution and one project and then we close the, 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 the deal. It's about supporting durable solutions. Since the crisis and migration has become really a, a phenomenon which is uh, for waiting for years and more than decades. But also or since uh, the, when you develop this uh, nexus approach, you need to integrate the needs of displaced and conflict affected communities into the global and national and local policies, which is not necessarily the case uh, currently when we need a conducive policy environment. It's really necessary in this respect. And we don't put just uh, the, 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 the work on the, the government institutions, which, but we still need uh, what we, uh, we, we, we miss currently is the need to really establish a long term plans and policies that anchor the integrated approach in terms of social, economic, but also the industrial development strategies in sustainable development, like the energy, the water, and the climate change. But uh, we need to be in mind, I think previous speakers highlighted is the circumstances of each country. The strategies or the planning need to be really uh, fit to the, the, uh, the context of each country. The strategies need to be tailored made and it cannot be really on one fits to all, be it for cross-sectorial or be it the way we handle the human aspect or the social aspect. Like if we take the extractive industries and the mining sector, for example. But uh, uh, since uh, well, we've been looking and uh, working on uh, just in the mid of March in the Arab Forum for Sustainable Development in the region, looking as a, one of the key weaknesses that we have is the access to finance. It's a region that just addresses less than 5% to climate finance. And this is really a, a, a burden in terms of building peace and building uh, enhancing the synergy between the different sectors. That's why dedicated financial programs by the international community should target sustainable infrastructure for rebuilding uh, post-conflict, human and institutional capacity of also building in the context of post-conflict and disaster reconstruction. And also we need to invest in physical infrastructure to enable just inclusive energy transition since energy can enable all the SDGs. Certainly the pub public uh, investment is necessary uh, and can be used to attract the private investment in the infrastructure, but we need really to work in uh, upscaling that to create create more jobs and invent in infrastructure that need to be aligned with the long-term plan. And the long-term plan, like if I take the water and energy and food, they really need to be aligned in a way that be reflected with the broader strategy, including the regional market integration that we uh, still lack in terms of uh, working together as a, as a region. And where a reflection was made on innovation in terms of technology, I would mainly focus on innovative financing mechanisms to unlock the private sector partnership. Usually it's one year budgeting, especially from the donors. It's really need to have a multi-year planning that can help unlock the private sector investment and adjust to the legal and financial framework that policymakers need to work on that in order to help de-risk this investment. And that's why if we take it from the, uh, the, 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 the donor perspective, it's need to move away from the traditional annual donor funding and look at from a long-term perspective, long-term strategy for supporting this kind of, uh, uh, of crisis, but also for supporting the integrated approach of the 2030 agenda. And that's why if we take it also from the humanitarian uh, peace uh, building, the UN member states in our region and globally and humanitarian development agencies, uh, peace, building, uh, peace building organization should really work together in terms of developing policies that are toward making the private sector partnership more feasible and desirable and operationalize that, which still uh, a weak point because they, they, they are not fully in integrated in the stakeholder engagement in a way to uh, have a responsibility in uh, delivering the SDGs. And uh, it goes without saying also when we speak about innovation is also looking to the situation of post-conflict, I would rather focus in the countries where we live, uh, where we, we, we need a collaboration between different sectors and industries in investing in emerging technologies. I think some of the speakers already highlighted uh, some of the technologies. I would just reflect that uh, in a region what has a huge potential in renewable energy, a huge potential from hydrogen development, this need to enhance also the di dialogue between European other markets with the Arab region in order to unlock these resources. And I want just to uh, conclude, since the time is, is also uh, over, in order to say that really collective outcomes that can 
only uh, reduce the need to and reduce uh, the vulnerabilities over multiple years of work. It's not just one installment toward one year of work. It's need really a long-term perspective. And uh, I don't think that 2030 is there. We uh, we, we still have a way to, to work and enhance the synergies and address trade-offs and all, only through collaboration that we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Radia. That was uh, that was really excellent and uh, great to learn about UNESCO's work uh, on uh, the Nexus approach in the Arab region. Uh, clearly, it's an example of uh, multiple crises interacting and uh, the need for uh, policy mixes, uh, coordinated investment, and uh, support levels uh, to effectively deal with that. And thanks for those e examples. Okay, so I think uh, we will now open the floor to uh, Q&A. I know we're running a little short on time, but uh, I would just ask the speakers uh, to turn on their microphones and cameras and uh, to uh, maybe we can have a, a quick uh, round or two of questions. Um, if you could limit your answers to uh, a minute so that everybody will have an opportunity to answer, that would be, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> There's, there's quite a lot of questions in the Q and A, and uh, I think just in 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 light of the discussion we have had here today, um, <clears throat> I think it's just something which is quite topical at the moment. Is um, what what are your opinions on the open letter calling for a halt to to AI development for for six months? Um, <clears throat> I think it cuts to uh, some of the issues that we've been dealing with today. Uh, you know, why should developments be decided by, you know, certain countries or, or industries or technology developers? And uh, they, they were specifically calling for the need for governance frameworks and uh, better managed development uh, of technologies uh, going forward. So it's really just a, an open question, but, you know, why should, um, you know, why should a small number of people decide how our, our development goes and uh, how can we put in place structures that uh, uh, make it work better for the SDG? Um, is there anyone who would like to, to, to start? Happy, happy to come in uh, quickly, David. I think this is, uh, yeah, um, definitely yeah. resonates with, um, with what we were um, uh, suggesting. On a general note, actually, I think th this exercise has already been there, uh, engaging a, a more broad-based engagement on on identifying uh, at at even at a country level. For example, when I was uh, sort of developing SDGs localization framework, framework, uh, it's not the government actually which was deciding. We we went to the people at in in different districts, those who are really uh, in, uh, at the ground level, and from there. Uh, we we had a three level steps to go uh, on deciding what is the SDGs localization agenda of Pakistan, for example. I think what is missed, uh, that is what we have spoken, is on the action on that. And that actually came from the very bifurcated policies. So I think the, the need is now to sort of integrate those policies uh, to go for a more coherent, more, more cohesive uh, sort of action uh, that is uh, there. So that was my, that, that the agenda setting was, I think, very much engaged, uh, but uh, surely there can be more engagement, uh, what is missing, there can be reprioritization at country levels, national levels, that what are the top uh, three, four that needs to be picked up, because we, we understand that not everybody, every country will be going to achieve all these things. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sajid. I think Tommaso is, is just coming in as well. Uh, Tommaso, would you like to add to that? No, I think I think yeah, this is um, a, a, a crucial question. I think one of the issues that I was mentioning before is definitely the uh, capabilities. Um, so um, again, there's there's so much inequality in the research which is done that it's very difficult uh, to think uh, that 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 there are capabilities in some of the countries to be able to shape the direction of research, for example, in AI. Uh, and this is just realistic. How much research on AI is happening? in most of the African countries, almost none. So what is the role that these countries can have in, in, in defining the direction that uh, AI research is having when AI will definitely shape uh, the way in which not only production 
uh, would be organized, but but now social relations would be organized. So instead of uh, you know um, uh, designing technologies which uh, which would be uh, useful to address uh, local problems, they would be uh, lots of the population would be using this technology, and this is problematic. So I think an important shift should be very simple. Um, to redirect fund, which is now mainly concentrated in, in, in high-income countries, to low-income countries, to middle-income countries. And this is something that research funders can do very easily. And there's been like, uh, the, the, there've been experiences in, 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 the, in the UK, in Sweden, in Canada, uh, to support research in, uh, in low-income countries. They need to be increased. Thanks for that, Tomas. So I see, Rabia, uh, you have your hand up. Yeah, I think just to add that uh, the climate change is an evidence that uh, global collaboration is needed. And that's why we are not all of us uh, in track in achieving the SDGs. And, uh, and uh, the three enablers, it's not just the policymakers, certainly the courage in order to make it much more sustainable, like the subsidies in, in terms of rationalizing subsidies for energy and water, so it can make uh, 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 maybe adjust inequality from other aspects, but uh, maybe uh, there is a compensation aspect that needs to be address in order to have the integrated approach in mind. But uh, the, the problem is the access to finance, sharing technology, and then you have the capacity of building the policy institutions. Otherwise, I think without uh, the, the adequate financing and sharing technology between uh, the different, those who hold the technology and those who are in need, we will not, never be in a situation where we can uh, achieve the SDGs or address the inequality. And this is globally, it's not just uh, at a national level. Okay, very good. Thanks, Rabia. Uh, Lydia, would you like to add to that? Uh, I cannot agree more uh, with Radia because uh, I believe that uh, in many challenges are absolutely global and we cannot uh, look at them in isolation of the rest of the world. So uh, what we need is, is collaboration and is uh, responsibility for uh, development of technology, for regulation, for protection of uh, end users, for fighting with uh, climate changes and uh, global effort is the only solution uh, which will uh, can respond uh, effectively. Thank you. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, Andrea, would you like to have a final word on that? Is... I think Andrea has left, actually. She dropped oh, the message okay. that she has left. Okay, very good, thanks. And... I'm conscious we're coming up to, to half one. And uh, just to, to close out before I pass to Irena, um, I just want to say, first of all, I think it's been very interesting to juxtapose goals nine and 10. Um, a lot is uh, in this way and to discuss the need for integrated approaches. Um, uh, I think it highlights the importance of tackling the SDGs in an integrated and not a siloed way. So, you know, when we're looking at increasing R&D or innovation, we need to be thinking about how this can help to reduce inequalities and the, the broader interactions across the agenda, and similarly for, for, for manufacturing. So I would just like to thank uh, all our speakers and everyone uh, uh, that tuned in for participating today. It was a very fruitful discussion, and I'll hand over now to Irina uh, for closing remarks. Thank you, everybody, and, uh, um, and I want to thank uh, very much uh, all the speakers, uh, David, of course, uh, to you for facilitating, Charles for organizing so brilliantly uh, these uh, webinars and, uh, and our um, always uh, good uh, and, and uh, I would say enlightening um, setting the scene speaker, Jan Gustav and everybody else. It was a really a very interesting uh, webinar and, uh, and we have really learned a lot how everything impacts everything, and how inequalities are actually uh, at the bottom of everything. And I'm so glad that we also talked about uh, about the other um, areas of work on, 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 on humanitarian and peace and how inequalities are also root causes often of that. Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, and uh, I just have to say that we always have a very good turnout on these webinars. We get a, a very good feedback, but they are not ending themselves. So uh, we are hoping uh, to very soon uh, organize communities of practice and we are counting on all of you uh, to continue this work uh, in the run-up to the LDG Summit and beyond. 
Um, and now uh, I would just like to close by saying um, that we are having um, another webinar that will address uh, the um, uh, the SDGs 11 on cities and 12 on uh, sustainable consumption and production. Uh, this time our uh, facilitator will be Dr. David O'Connor, um, who is IUCN representative at the United Nations, and he worked also um, at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations and and others, but you'll hear more about that next time. Uh, I hope you'll be all able to join us also. Uh, and uh, our next uh, webinar will be on the 27th of April. So uh, put this down on your uh, in your calendars and I hope to see you all there. Thank you once again uh, to all the speakers uh, for the insightful and really great uh, webinar. And uh, to you, David, and uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of your day, evening or afternoon. Um, and back to you, Charles. Thank you. I think, I think we have lost Charles. Yeah, it looks like we have. Um, so um, if we have lost him, I just wanted to close then the webinar. Uh, and thank you all, everybody, uh, and uh, see you next time. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, bye. everyone. Bye.